Tonight on Two on Two, we'll go backstage at the Lyric Opera to see how they make it all happen. We'll see how doctors treat performing artists. We'll visit some apartments specially designed for the deaf or hearing impaired. And we'll visit with the folks who breed Siamese fighting fish. Hi, I'm Bob Wallace. And I'm Don Craig. And Two on Two is back on the air this week after a little winter timeout. For our bears to be Super Bowl. Champs. There you go. We're going to start off this week's show with a look at the magic of opera. Magic it is, too, because how else could you transform an empty stage into a Japanese garden for Madame Butterfly or an Egyptian tomb for Aida? Well, come on backstage and we'll show you how. On this stage, magic is made. With music and costumes and scenery, the stage of Chicago's lyric opera becomes Paris, 1850. It's the opening party scene of Verdi's La Traviata. Magicians, theatrical or otherwise, usually don't reveal their secrets. Usually. Welcome to Lyric, and more specifically, welcome to the closet. I'd like to welcome you all to the regular men's chorus dressing room. Welcome to the wig and makeup department. Several times during the winter, the opera opens its doors for backstage tours. Opera buffs can get a musician's eye view from the orchestra pit. Now, an orchestra conductor is the most important person at any given performance. He tells when it starts, when it stops, how fast, how slow, if there's applause, how long do we wait, or do we wait at all. Or they can visit with a chorus member and hear a little backstage gossip about Placido Domingo. He autographed a record that I gave to my parents as a Christmas gift. He autographed his book, and we really all adore him. He's my ideal of a tenor. The tour starts in the wardrobe department. Costumes are not made with zippers or buttons for several reasons. Uh, probably the prime reasons are that when you're in a hurry, zippers jam and buttons pop. Directly Jan from the Gintes from the Opera Peter Guild's Hall board of directors showed off some of the lyrics' center. fanciest finery. This gorgeous costume right here is worn this season uh, by Violetta in La Traviata, and it was made in Florence, Italy, and it cost about $3,600. It's here that shoes are fitted or made to fit, and it's here that costumes are refurbished or made up entirely, like these two gowns from the Barber of Seville. We make the costumes to look as good from the first row to the very last row of the opera house. One of the high points of this backstage tour is the catwalk, leading visitors six floors above the stage to get to the prop rooms. I'd like to bring you through the main prop room and show you the many props that we've used uh, during the years. And Eddie Klein's the man in charge here. He's been property master for 20 years. These torches get a lot of use. It's a propane tank put into a can attached to a club with some screen wire and asbestos and we can adjust the size of the flame by these valves. The prop rooms are like the most wonderful attic you've ever seen. Here are the big flower pots used in La Traviata, a Buddha from Madame Butterfly, skeletons from Don Giovanni, a bird for banquets. That's a rose pink that we use for banquet scenes, and uh, we trot that out every time they want a banquet. This wind machine provides sound effects for stormy scenes and operas like Rigoletto. Here are two more contemporary dueling swords that were used this year in Otello. They were made for Othello. They're very, very handsome. Yeah. Items from the Lyric Armory are always crowd pleasers. Helmets and crowns and swords made by European craftsmen. Armorer Ken Stenstrom says they have 50 of some helmets in both silver and copper, but others are one of a kind. This was worn by Charlie Oppen in Boris Gudnoff and still has its mink trim. He says the swords are not kept sharp. This is a trick sword, the type that you do yourself in rather painlessly. Because it's retractable blade. This is the trick sword used in Faust. Uh, when during the duel, it breaks in half. So it is made with a little trigger here. And as it's thrust, it breaks. <laughs> And you see, everything works if you just know the right trick. 
Winding downstairs and through hallways, a visitor really gets a sense of how vast the Opera House building is and how much work goes into the production of an opera. In the wig and makeup room, for instance, we're told that the wigs are cleaned after every performance. This one will give you a good idea of the construction of these wigs. This is a very lightweight wig that's made entirely on a net. It weighs only perhaps two ounces, and it's very comfortable to wear. The bad part is that it has to be glued to the head. Uh, Around us are the chorus wigs from Capuletti, Traviata, and Maestro Singer. They also do mustaches and goatees here, too. This net that everybody worries about really has a tendency to disappear into the skin as soon as it's glued down. Of course, this is made with a very fine net, the kind that's used for film and television. It's very expensive. The final stop on the tour is the stage of the Opera House. There is no amplification of sound to the house itself. It's here that swords and costumes and props all come together to make the magic of opera. And standing on this magnificent stage, it sure is easy to let your imagination whisk you away, say, to Paris around 1850. Well, the Lyric is wrapped up in schedule of tours for this year. And those tours were a big success. Keep an eye out for them next winter. Coming up, something some of those opera singers might be interested in. A clinic for ailing performers 